So we tested it at home. I'm not going to, I tested it here, but we're just going to. So, but I've got 20 feet, so I can, but I'll have to, okay. <laughs> this is a test run. But I noticed when I do the recording, I wander away from the computer, and then you guys can't hear me. And that's sad. So, um, but now because I'm attached, I'm now tethered to this end of the room. If you guys would just send papers and reading questions, just reach up and pass it to the people in front of you. And then to and then pass it towards me in waves of papers. Oh, they missed the whole lecture on comma splices because I didn't turn the computer on. Wonderful. It's already happening. Oh, actually I have another little clip that I can attach it to my or attach it to maybe like the paper or something. Well, no. I, I will yeah, it's okay. I, I can I can deal with it. Okay. So it's all right. Time. It's all right. Um, first of all, did you guys have a nice break? Yeah. Did you get out in the sunshine a little bit? Yeah. It was really very nice, wasn't it? Here had the thing one, uh, the computer that had paper on. First of all, we lost it, and then it lost power, so I didn't get to see it. Ah. I'm so sorry it. to hear that. Someone lost it, and you can find it, and this is, it lost power, so I couldn't redo it. This is why I really love pens and papers. I'm just going to admit, like I just, I really yeah, love I pens and papers. Paper first, and then yes, I but it's nice to type it because yeah. then it makes it nice and tidy and neat for me to read. So, oh, yay! Um, I had you do quite a bit of reading. Did everybody bring their copy of Julius Caesar with them? Did everybody get the memo? It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Maybe, it's maybe you can peek on, we're not reading it in one week, just FYI. And also, it's not full of text because it's a play. Yeah. You know, there's blank places on space. Yes, Alice. Um, yeah, run down and go get it. We're going we're gonna to read from it. We're gonna, towards the end of the hour, I want to start reading it with you so you can kind of get used to the way it is. Has anybody in here read a Shakespeare play before? Okay, okay. So for some of you, what did you read, Ethan? Julius Caesar. Oh, you've read Julius Caesar already? Oh, shoot. I, have two. I try so hard to find and stuff that nobody's so read. Ago, um, you had us get one of the eagle or something? The eagle of the ninth? Yeah. Yeah, but does that have something to do with Shakespeare? No. Okay. Yeah. Um, after, <laughs> I'm just trying to follow the conversation. Um, it's it's after, after the Julius Caesar. Yes. Why am I opening my? Still using. Figure out how to use it. Why don't you not worry about it? <laughs> just, just do. <laughs> I was gonna say do what you're told. That's that was harsh. <laughs> but I'm like I will inform you. It will be okay. I I I did the planning, and you can just not have to worry about it. How about that? Put this down here. Okay. Thank you. So, over break, I had you read, first of all, from our Dorothy Mills book. And we had two, now I know that it was a lot of people and stuff going on. Would you agree there was a lot of people and stuff going on? Okay. So, <clears throat> that's why I give you the questions, and that's, I'm just going to highlight the things that I feel like we wanted to take from that, okay? Because when you are older in high school, you will meet these people again. But it doesn't really make sense. By the time of the play, Julius Caesar, and by the time of 70 years later, by the time Jesus is, dies, this is the Roman Empire. Rome, of course, took over this in their wars with Carthage, right? We read in the same year they had moved over into Greece. We're reading in Josephus about the unrest in Judea, right? How Rome is coming in and taking over there. Uh, during some of the wars we're going to read about this coming week, Egypt is going to fall to them. Julius Caesar is going to fight wars in Gaul. And eventually, um, Julius Caesar is going to go all, all the way to England, to Britain. Um, and I just want to reiterate, this is 500 miles. I want you to think about the area that we're talking about here. 
huge. And it takes a lot of money and manpower and organization to do this, right? But the, the portion that you read it kind of led you up to how one person ended up getting to be in charge. Because remember, after they threw out their kings, they had that terrible Tarquin, the last king. Oh, and they said, no more kings. No. They have a republic, and we read about that, and they elect two consuls, and they have a senate, and they have tribunes to stand up for the rights of the people. And then suddenly, you know, in our Roman history minds, suddenly there's an emperor. How did that happen? It didn't, it didn't happen overnight. And what we're reading about is how that happened. But the first portion you read was about um, uh, the Tiberius and Caius Gracchus. All right, do you remember? You, you might have read this a week ago. I know, maybe not this last week. And I asked you, what sorts of laws did Tiberius and Caius Gracchus try to enact? Just very broad. Does anybody remember the Gracchus brothers? What are they trying to accomplish, Anna? Okay, they stood up for the people and a particular group of people. Poor people. Poor people. Yeah, Alice. Yes, because the soldiers would come back from the arm from fighting and they'd be left without anything. Let me read a couple of excerpts from Dorothy Mills. I skipped the first question. It says, uh, how did successful conquest of the Mediterranean change Rome and its people? Um, I just want to read, point out a couple of the paragraphs here that seemed important to me. Before the Punic Wars, Rome had been chiefly an agricultural state, but the wars had almost ruined the farmers. In the old days, the land belonging to Rome had been divided into small farms, and every free man who lived in the country had owned a piece of land, which he cultivated and on which he built his home. As the long years of war went by, these farmers had been called away to join the army. Many never returned. No one was left to work the farms, and they were either ruined or else bought up by some rich man who employed large numbers of slaves to do the work. Now, this might seem, oh, that's 2,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, we, do, we don't care. But think about America. When America first began, what was the job of most people? No. What was the job? Farming. What Farming. Most people farmed. America was agricultural. And of course, we live in the agricultural heartland, right? But factories were built. More and more young people decided to move to cities. Cities grew. And then suddenly, sometimes, there's no, there's no sun left to take over the farm. And you lose the farm. And about, it was in the 1980s that they did farm aid and everything. Um, banks were foreclosing on farms. Farms, farmers were no longer able to make a living. And many farms were lost. And what happened to them, they were bought up by big companies, company farms. Or we read about the, um, like, I don't even know what to call them, like industrial size chicken farms or cattle farms. Y you know what I mean? Instead of, instead of a small, small dairy farm, you've got thousands and thousands of cows running through like on a factory, you know, to be milked, that sort of thing. This happened, this has happened in our country. We are not primarily an agricultural country anymore. Although we live in a place where there are lots of farmers, so it's easy for us to, to forget that. So this, is just, this is a problem of society, not just the Roman society. Um, these changes in Rome, the increase of wealth and its use to purchase luxuries, the increase of slave labor instead of that of freemen, the change from an agricultural to a city and commercial life were brought about by the wars which had made her mistress of the Mediterranean. All right, we already see how farming changed because all the young farmers got called off to go to war. Plus, when you conquer people, what do you get? 
loot, yeah. Land. Land, and the land gives you loot too. Yes, and people can be loot, unfor unfortunately. You know what I mean? Because if you enslave a conquered population, you sell them. I know, it's, it sounds very, it sounds a little funny and kind of harsh, but it's true. When you conquer this, you get rich. And what often happens to a group of people, I suppose this could be individuals too, when they start out rough, but they get rich, EJ? They become lazy. Is that what you were going to say? Uh, they were going to be um, people of power that they could just tell anyone to do anything. Okay. So they just were lazy and just had everyone else do everything. Yeah. That was, yeah. Do, do you think, do you think that's true of most groups of people? Like when things are really, really comfortable, is it hard to be disciplined? I think so. I mean, think about it. America is comfortable. We, we are comfortable people. Even people who don't have a lot in America have more than much of the world, right? Okay. So everybody in this room is rich by world standards. Maybe not by American standards, but by world standards, certainly by all of history standards. Mm -hmm. And is it easy just to be lazy? Mm -hmm. You know, this has nothing to do, well, it does have to do with Rome, but I'm just going to veer off into this because we're talking about it. What's one of the, okay, let think how to ask this question. What, if you wanted to be a Christian in the first 300 years of Christianity, what might happen to you? Cut. Uh, pushed by um, the martyrs. Yeah, death. Death. It, it wasn't all the time. There were many Christians who didn't get killed, but it was a possibility. It was always a possibility. So the do you think the early Christians, do you think people signed on to become a Christian lightly? No. 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 It was a step that you thought about long and hard. There was a long process of training. The catechumenate, the catechumen is a, is a Christian in training to make sure, are you sure you want to do this? Because this, this is what you're signing up for. And so how disciplined do you think those early Christians were in their yeah. discipleship? They, they signed on for something serious. They weren't just playing around. This could cost them their life. But w we have it easy, right? I'm thankful that I can be a Christian in this country and, and, and not die. I'm really, really thankful for that. But I also realize in my own life, it can make me very complacent and lazy. I don't, I, I have not just one Bible. I have multiple Bibles sitting on my shelf in different translations. Does that mean I always am disciplined in reading it? Because it's easy to do other things. But if I had, I bet if I had one tattered copy, you know what I mean? It was the only one in my village, you know, and oh, it, would be a, it would be so treasured. Does that make sense? Whenever we get really prosperous and we have lots of options and we get cushy in, you know, we eat whatever we want. And we go wherever we want. That's why the early Christians fasted. It wasn't to earn their way to heaven. It was to discipline themselves. Because if you discipline yourself in one area, you can be disciplined in other areas. That's what it was about. So anyway, that isn't, that's just a side thing. But this happened to the Romans. The Romans were not Christian, but they weren't disciplined in being Romans anymore. You know, this whole, we do our duty and we work hard and we um, make sacrifices, like remember Regulus, who was willing to keep his promise to the Carthaginians to go back, even though it was gonna cost him his life. The Romans got lazy. And one of the laziest, well, that's so judgmental, one of the laziest, most luxurious groups of all were the rich people, the rich people into whose hands everything was falling. So then we had the Gracchus brothers, the famous story, this is in every Roman book for, for kids, um, that uh, 
No, that's C. No. Okay. Um, I'm assuming it's still picking up my voice. Uh, their mom, Cornelia, her dad was Scipio Africanus. Okay. So Grandpa was the guy who defeated Hannibal. All right. So Mom Cornelia had this hoity-toity wealthy girlfriend, and she came over, and she's like, oh, look at my fancy jewelry. Look at my rings. And I'm like, where are your jewels, Cornelia? And they say, Cornelia called her two sons to her and said, these are my jewels. These boys are my jewels. So they grew up to fight for um, the rights of people to make a living, basically, to have land, to have enough food. And, and how did that work out for them? Not well. Not well. What, in what way? Uh, they were not supported by the government or anyone who had power. Yes. And? What was the news telling them was that they were actually other people who were underfed? Yes. Yeah. Yes. But back to Port Tiberius and Caius. It wasn't, it, it was worse than that. They both got killed in mob riots. They both got killed at different times, trying to do the same things. Yes. Yeah, that's pleasant, isn't it? Um, they wanted to take, uh, this, is, this is timely too, they wanted to take, unfortunately, the, the, their, their fix was going to be taking land from rich people and doling it out to the poor, redistribution of property. Which, unfortunately, unless you get the people you're going to take the property away from on your side, they don't react well to that, having stuff taken away from them. But, so this was something that, that the Roman, Romans in, say, 150 B.C., 125 B.C., they're dealing with. How do we have a fair society in which everyone has a chance to make a living in this new world, this new world where we're the masters of the Mediterranean? The Gracchus brothers tried and they failed. They refer to this as the social war because social has to do with society and they wanted to fix some of what was wrong with society. Does that make sense? So if that's all, you, if you remember the Gracchi, the Gracchus brothers wanted to feed people and dole out land, and they didn't do well. I guess Gracchus, he died, I, I would say because of one of the laws he was trying to make, like for, um, trying to make equality for all of Italy, right? Mm-hmm. Like, oh, yes, know? yes, th good, thank you for bringing that up. Yes, another problem that they had was at this point, um, Roman, people who lived in Rome were Roman citizens. People who lived outside of Rome may be just as wealthy and intelligent and competent, but they weren't Roman citizens. And they had to figure out, remember the whole, I conquer you and assimilate you sort of thing as they took over Italy? What do we do with these people? Do, do, do we let them become senators? Do we let them become governors of provinces, or is that only people from the city of Rome? And eventually, even though maybe Caius was ahead of his time, eventually they did grant all Italians Roman citizenship. And as Dorothy Mills pointed out, this, this is going to spread and spread. There was never a time when everyone in the empire was a Roman citizen. <clears throat> but many people received Roman citizenship, including the Apostle Paul whose parents were made citizens. We don't know how. Sometimes it was because you did some spectacular thing for the, for the government. Um, sometimes uh, soldiers were settled into a colony and they were all um, given citizenship in, in the days when some soldiers weren't citizens yet. But, but yes, the, the guard, uh, Paul asked the guard, uh, is it legal for you to, to flog a Roman citizen without a trial? And the guy's like, no, it's not. And uh, he said, the guard said, I paid a lot for my citizenship. Apparently, you could buy it. Mm -hmm. And Paul said, I was born a citizen. So his parents were citizens. We don't know how. Hannah, what did you want to say? Mm -hmm. Possible. 
I'd like I'd like to think Paul's parents didn't bribe, but I don't know Paul's I parents. Know they didn't bribe. I I don't know. I don't know that. Um, okay, so I asked you what three great dangers Rome faced in the first century. And I don't I don't actually expect you to just remember these off the top of your head and I have your papers. So I will tell you. Um, okay, guess, guess. Okay. I have like a specific like open frontiers, revolting Greek states, and overpowering Senate, along with the along with the conflicting parties of the, <laughs> the people and Senate. Okay. So what I was going for, I'm gonna read see I have oh, my little highlights. All right. Rome was now confronted with three grave perils. The first concerned her frontiers. All right. Being overrun from the north over the Alps again by these crazy people called Gauls. They were. The Druids and the paint yourself blue people. Okay. Um, and then it says, greater than these external dangers, I'm sorry, the next danger came from the east where Mithridates king of um, Pontus was inciting the Greek states to revolt, which he mentioned. All right, so we have problems here. We have problems here. You guys actually nailed it pretty good. But greater than these external state dangers was that which threatened Rome from within. Two distinct parties, the Senate and the people. Right. You actually did really well, not having your papers in front of you. Um, so, we have the Senate. <laughs> Who's in the Senate? The senators, I know. That's that's <laughs> not really the answer I wanted. Okay. Well what okay, wealthy people. People from the old respected families, right? Who's not in the Senate? Everybody else. All right. Other other people who just were not of a class allowed to be in the Senate. And how do you think the other people are gonna eventually feel about this? It's wrong. We it's should wrong. have a say. We should it's have our, a say. It's our country. It's our place. Exactly. Exactly. What made them so much smarter than we are? Well, nothing. Nothing. They, they finally figured that out. And so, uh, can you see how this is related to the Gracchus? Mm -hmm. You know, we have problems. The people need substance, sustenance. People want power also in the government. So, the first guy I had you read about was Marius. Um, so, your reading this week and next week is a series of generals, right? A series of commanders, one after the other, culminating in Julius Caesar. So, basically, if this becomes confusing, I'll just, just think, this is the road to Julius Caesar. How does one guy get to be in charge? And we started with Marius. Um, I asked you guys, how did Marius change the Roman military? Does anybody remember what Marius did that had never been done before? Hannah, do you think you know? Yes. A professional standing army, we would say. Before this, remember, well, I just we just mentioned it earlier, who was the Roman army? People, they just called people yeah. and they're like, for your country. Yes. That's all yes. Which is a good reason. Yeah. But they had no specific training. Now remember back the Greeks, remember Sparta, yeah. where their whole lives were military training? And that was true for pretty much all the Greeks. And if you have a group of people that are pretty, um, how to say it, like disciplined and pretty hardy and, and ready, to fight. ready to fight, it's okay. But remember what we just said is happening here. We're getting lazy, we're getting a little soft around the middle, we're eating lots of donuts. They had donuts. If they had, they would have been eating lots of donuts, I'm sure. And so Marius got the idea that he could have a group of people trained, ready to go at a moment's notice. And they would all live together. Now, I want you to stop and just think about this for a minute. You're a soldier now. 
Everybody, you're a soldier. You've just been promoted or demoted. I don't know. You're a soldier. <laughs> and we are out in the field. We are going to spend years together. All right? And we... <laughs> Who is going to be the most important person in our lives? Simi. Oh. <laughs> who's going to run your life? Who's who's going to who? The person in charge, the commander in chief, the general, the general of our group. He's going to be the guy who has our backs. He's going to be the guy who stands up for us. He's going to be the guy who leads us out into battle. He's going to be the guy who our lives depend upon. We're going to be very devoted to him. Does that make sense to everybody? Remember that. Remember, if you're in the Army, your general is your guy. Okay. So Marius got the idea that we would have a professional standing Army and something else happened under Marius. They were fighting in Africa. You know, they're always fighting somewhere. They were fighting in Africa. And uh, there was a disagreement um, about who should be in charge. And Marius had been fighting in the army. And then Marius came back and he was elected consul, which meant he would be in charge of that army. He was elected consul by the people. The people said, I vote for Marius to be in charge of the army. Basically, that's what they did when they elected him consul. That hadn't really been done before. The Senate said who was in charge of the army. The people said, we, we want Marius. We want Marius. And Dorothy Mills says, for the first time in their history, the people had taken charge of a foreign war. And the people had taken control of the army. The leader of the army became a popular leader. All right? It wasn't just the Senate in conclave saying, oh, we should send out, you know, Fabius, Maximus, or Scipio here or there. The people are starting to have a vote. We love Marius. Let's have him. We want him to be general. See the difference? Yeah, and then like and the then Marius way. forms an army. It's always there with him. Who are they going to love? Marius. Marius. Yes, Kyle. Um, so um, let's say they did not, if the Senate like, overruled the Marius, what do you think is going to happen to the Senate? If you all want Marius and the Senate like, no, yes. no, we'll do someone else. There's what going to be some sort of, which, okay, which happens, and the next guy. So Marius is the first link in the chain. The next link in the chain is named Sulla. All right, and did I ask you? Oh, yes, uh, I said who was Marius' main opponent. Okay, I just answered that for you, Sulla. I asked you, what did the two men have in common? Um, oh, they're both generals, and they both wanted to be in charge. Um, but here's the problem. It's exactly what we were talking about. The Senate appointed Sulla to be in charge, the assembly of the people, Marius. Uh oh, yes. And here's how it here's how it ended. Sulla, at the head of an army, marched to Rome and settled the question between him and Marius by force. <laughs> what? <laughs> this is not good. If I live in Rome, I'm just I'm just you know some lady living in Rome. Do I want generals marching in with their army and fighting each other here? I don't. The answer is no. I don't. This is not good. This is not good. This is going to be decades of civil war. And can you see how it's going to happen? We want so-and-so to be the general. Or the army says, we back John Doe, because he's our general. You know, Publius Doe. <laughs> I don't know. Because he's our general. We'll do anything for him. We'll go fight the other guy's soldiers for him over and over because what this makes me think of like athletes you know say you're an Olympic athlete and you you 
break the world record. What's probably going to happen later? Yeah, somebody's going to break it, and then they're going to get better and better. And you see how my army's on top now, but there's always somebody coming. Do you see? And it's going to go on and on. Yes, Kyle. Uh, so if there's two generals who one is going to go through the one who goes to the Senate, then there's two consuls. Why would they live it for the dictator, or is that? No, consuls? it was it was for consuls, but it's getting to the point where consul and general aren't the same thing necessarily. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. But that's an excellent question. Because yes, previously you could have two people in charge and it was fine. Mm -hmm. But remember, um, look at all this area that we're getting where we have to take care of business all the time. And these people don't enjoy being ruled over necessarily. They're rebelling. And you've got to have armies stationed at various places, more than two armies. Mm -hmm. When it was just Italy, that worked pretty well. Mm -hmm. When it was more than just Italy, it didn't. Okay, here are your reading questions for next time. It's a fairly long thing again, but we are going to push our way to Julius Caesar. Okay, since we're going to start reading the play, we good to push our way through. So I'm just going to hand this. Please take and then hand behind you. And there should end up being a couple of extras. You can just lay those on the table. And I will email to um, Alec and Jacob. Oh, you could take an extra one for Jacob if you want to. And then um, for Ella. Okay, we finished our Josephus reading as well. It's not good. It's not good. Our Josephus reading. We finished our Josephus yeah. reading, I said. I would like you guys to add to your timelines. We didn't add the destruction of Jerusalem, did we? We did. On 70 AD? We did. Oh, we did. Okay. Sure. I kind of sort of remembered doing it, but then I thought I didn't remember Pretty getting sure. our AD page out, so. Oh, okay. So we are finally moving on to the AD page, and I believe you should have one that's 1 AD to 500, maybe? I don't know if we did yeah, 500. All right. And in 70 AD, destruction of Jerusalem. <laughs> Again. Because I think we already have some, yeah, we, we have a 586 destruction of Jerusalem. Now we've got these 70 AD. Remember last week I mentioned, <clears throat> I'll just talk while you write. Um, I mentioned that Jesus and his disciples were walking around Jerusalem during uh, the Passion Week. And, the, you know, Rabbi, look at these beautiful buildings. Look at the beautiful temple. And he said, I tell you the truth. Not one stone will be left on another. It's all coming down. And I just want you to think about this. We don't know exactly when Jesus, what year Jesus was born in, okay? But we're going to say roughly somewhere around 30 AD, Jesus died. This is 40 years later. As far as we know, the Apostle John is still living. Interestingly, he doesn't, if we don't, that's part of the dating of Revelation, you know, in the dating of his letters, he doesn't ever mention the destruction of Jerusalem. But maybe he just didn't. No, he did care, but maybe he didn't have a reason to. So, so theologically, let's just stop, before we talk about the history, theologically, religiously, what does the destruction of the temple mean for the Jews? No worship place. No worship place. This is the only legitimate place to offer sacrifices. They have no place anymore. Yeah, Kyle. I was about to say, there's no, no place for them to be saved. But they couldn't. Not Jews couldn't. Jews couldn't. Jews couldn't. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Jews so why 
Wh what? It forced the Jews to believe in God and believe in Christ. Un unfortunately, it, it didn't. <laughs> that would have been <laughs> nice. But yes. Because, okay, so why? Mm. What? No, Kyle, let me. When the Babylonians came and destroyed Jerusalem in 586 BC, why did God let that happen? What do you think, Kyle? Because they were disobeying and they weren't doing what they were supposed to. They were worshiping idols. And back, back, way back, when they came into the land, they were told, if you follow God with your whole heart, this will be your land. And if you don't, I, I will send prophets to warn you. I will send problems to warn you. And if you don't listen, I will kick you out. God didn't use the term kick you out, but that was basically. All right. And then they came back again. Now, this is kind of a nebulous question maybe for you guys. What is the connection now? Why would God allow Jerusalem and the temple to be destroyed now? in 70 AD. What's, what's changed? What's different? Kyle, tell me what you think. Christ has come, so there's no way to be saved. And if you keep on the temple, people are less likely to come to believe that Jesus is the one true God. Okay. There's no way to be saved. We don't need that temple anymore. That was the place where God, and so, and I love these stories. And I, frankly, have no reason to not believe them. Uh, people read supernatural things sometimes in books that aren't the Bible, and they're like, oh, I don't know about that. But do you remember the section, the um, warnings given to the Jews before the destruction of the temple? This is a very famous one. Not many days after the festival, um, this is Passover, after the festival, there appeared in the skies just before sunset a number of chariots poised in the air and armies of soldiers speeding through the cloud. And at the Feast of Pentecost, when the priests entered the inner court of the temple, they heard a great noise, and after this a loud voice as of a multitude saying, We are departing hence. We're leaving. I withdraw my presence from here. Now, what happened during the crucifixion at the temple. The curtain tore. The curtain that always separated that holy of holies where only the high priest gets to go and only once a year. And the only thing in there is the Ark of the Covenant. That's it. From the outer place where the bread was and the incense and, and, the, and the lights, okay? You can come into the Holy of Holies now. You can come in. No. No. Because everything is going to be made holy now. We're still in the process. Each of us is being made holy, right? Eventually, the whole world is going to be recreated and made holy. It all becomes holy, but it spreads out. Right? I don't think the earth will become holy. I think the heaven is holy, so we are just... Well, it says in Revelation that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Okay. I don't know. Anyway, this is not a end times class, <laughs> unfortunately, because that would be interesting. But so do you see how, from a religious perspective, this is sort of the final death knell of this was the old way to come to God? Jesus is now the way to come to God. Jesus is the, is the lamb. Jesus is the sacrificial victim. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, so if that's kind of nebulous, let's talk about the history though. In Jerusalem, it was awful. And, and does anybody kind of get a sense of what, what was going on in that last few years in Jerusalem? What was it like inside Jerusalem? Terrible. Terrible, in what way? Well, there weren't we're, there, no no Christians. Actually, well, I, I won't say there weren't any Christians, but actually, this is an interesting thing. Um, 
you know, Jesus said, I, I think I read this to you last week, when you see, when you see these things coming, flee to the hills, let no one, and the Christians left the city when the Romans started surrounding the city, because they remember what Jesus said. Like he said, flee to the hills. We do not want to go into the city. However, surrounding people flooded into the city. Jews flooded into the city because there were a bunch of rebel forces. Remember we talked about that a little bit two weeks ago. Josephus was the in charge of one of them, right? And they was war here, war there, war in Galilee. And like, I'm holing up in Jerusalem, it has a big wall. But there were some nasty people in Jerusalem. And we read about this guy, John of Giscala. And um, uh, it says the zealot party was split into two factions. John of Giscala was in charge of one and there was another group. The two parties watched each other closely, but rarely, if ever, appealed to the sword. They both, however, assailed the populace and vied with each other in the quantity of plunder they could extort. They didn't fight each other, they just fought everybody else. It was like, I smell food in there. Bring it out. <laughs> Seriously, or I will kill you. That's how they took care of business in Jerusalem. I know, it, it was awful. And then, if that wasn't ridiculous enough, um, so there was, uh, going on, it says, um, another war broke out. Okay, so Jerusalem already has two factions extorting the people for money. Um, another war broke out which caused Simon, son of Gesorus, a Gerasian, which was caused by Simon. He was not as artful as John, who was now master of the city, but was superior in bodily strength and daring. All right? He get, threw him out, and he went to this stronghold of Masada that we're going to talk about later. So we have two guys, Simon and John. So the Zealot party, the John party, is pounding on the people. Who do the people invite in? Simon, the other rebel guy. A council was held with the chief priests, and it was resolved that they should call in Simon to their aid, a measure which only added to the miseries of the city by admitting a second tyrant. Now, these two guys are going to fight with each other. Inside the city. Inside the city. Sometimes even, did you notice this? Holding up inside the temple. Holding themselves up inside the temple like a temple. The temple is a, is, is a military fortress. Welcome. Yes. Oh, I know. Um, and, it, and Josephus says this. While Titus was on his way, the unhappy city of Jerusalem, daily weakened by civil dissensions, was torn by still another faction. It was a sedition within a sedition, which like a ravenous wild beast preyed upon its own flesh. Now the, the zealot party is split into two. They're fighting with each other, and they've got the Simon, and then who is the loser? All the rest of the people. We're getting killed left and right and have nothing to eat. It says, um, at times when the party above, in other words, the Temple Mount was up higher, we're above, we can throw things down on you, in other words, through fatigue, refrained from hurling down their missiles, John would sally out against Simon and his adherents. Listen to this. As far as he was able to drive them before him, he would set fire to the storehouses filled with corn and provisions to that extent. Simon, in his turn, would drive him back with fire and sword, so that the space around the temple became a mass of ruins, and a great quantity of corn, which for them would be barley or wheat, which might have sufficed the besieged for many years, was burnt up. They burnt their own food. I know, that, that noise. That's how I feel. Okay, so in the meantime, Titus is, is besieging the city. He is trying to get them to surrender because they're dying in there. By the way, did you catch? So if, we're, if I'm in Jerusalem and I decide, oh, I have had enough of this, I'm going outside and just handing myself over to the Romans. At least they might feed me. Can I do that? 
No, because the people in charge will kill me if they find out I want to go to the Romans. I know. I have nothing to eat, but... Don't tell anyone, just leave. Uh, they had posts, they had guards around. Oh, it was nasty. So Titus is outside, and it says, Titus, anxious to preserve the city from destruction, continually during the siege used every means to induce the Jews to surrender and sent Josephus to address them in their native tongue. Josephus with difficulty found a spot from whence he might be heard and at the same time to be out of reach of the missiles. From thence he harangued his countrymen at great length, using every argument in his power to induce them to surrender, but all in vain. Um, so eventually, Titus builds a wall around Jerusalem, another wall, so no food can get in and out. Famine raged among them with terrible violence, and thousands upon thousands died. The houses were full of dying women and children, and the streets were choked with the bodies of the dead. Okay, so I was debating with my husband. Okay, we have a, a, a parent present. Should I tell the most famous kind of gruesome story of the siege of Jerusalem, or are they too young for this? Do you know the story to which I am referring? Okay. Um, I mean, it's no worse than what happened at Masada, where they all killed each other and then committed suicide. Um, the merry go round of death, no, it really isn't that much. Well, yeah, well, yeah, it is. Um, okay, I'm going for it. I'm going for it. Um, it there was a mother, I'll just, she, she killed her child and ate her child. Are you talking about in the Bible? No, in the siege of Jerusalem. And I want you to just think about a Jewish woman being reduced to that. And the thugs, the thugs that come around and, you know, the thugs smelled something. Bring it out. And they said she was just, I mean, I can't imagine... What extremity you must come to, to be that. You, you know what I mean? Like, what horrors. And so she, she brought out the rest, and she's like, well, I already had some, here you go. And, and even the thugs were appalled. And it took a lot to appall these thugs, all right? And she said, well, if you don't want any, leave the rest for me. Josephus tells that story in his Jewish Wars. Yeah. Now, I can't, uh, I should look this up. I can't remember, but I feel, no, maybe not, never mind, never mind. I shouldn't speculate. Um, it was horrible. And the reason, it's not, I mean, it, does, it is shocking, but I just, because I'm about to read to you the numbers here. So when Jerusalem finally falls and it gets set fire to, um, Josephus tells us, uh, just a second, Kyle. Um, the number of prisoners taken during the war was 97,000. Well, during the siege, there perished, listen, 1,100,000 people. A million people died in the siege of Jerusalem. I just, and so the story I have told you has shock value, obviously, but it also is bigger than that. It's the horrors, the horrors that came on this city to the point. So imagine how much death and carnage you must have already seen to do this to your own child. Do you know what I mean? How deadened? how hardened and desensitized, because you walk out your front door and there's just bodies. That's what it was like for month after month after month. This was horrific. And I just, I don't know what story more encapsulates. Because, you know, we've read about a lot of wars. You read, oh, wars, they're trapped in the city, blah, blah, blah. Okay, now let's put it in, the perspective of a person 
where you do something so shocking that the guys who are indiscriminately stealing food and killing people are shocked. That's bad. Yeah, Kyle. So if there's people standing on the streets, why is there a child living food instead of dead bodies? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, because she was she was hiding it too to keep it to herself. Um, so Titus conquered uh, Jerusalem, and he brought back some of the leaders to a triumph, which the Roman uh, generals were allowed to come through and parade uh, captives and loot in front of the people. And in Rome, it still stands the Arch of Titus. I, I had these pictures made. Um, I'm going to just like give them to you and pass them back, OK? I want you to see what you're going to see. And then maybe you can all kind of look and, and just pass them along and weave them back. This is the Arch of Titus. And um, famously, on the inside of the arch, there are carvings showing the triumph. And here's a close-up of one of them. They're carrying the, the menorah, the branch candlestick from the temple. Can you, if you'll be able to see it. Here, I will just give this to you and they will weep through. And then I want to get to Julius Caesar. Um, so towards the end, uh, you know, after Jerusalem was conquered, towards the end of our reading, that didn't wipe out all rebellion. There was one last stronghold at a place called Masada that we talked about earlier. This is an aerial view of Masada. This is one tough place to get up to, as you can see. It's an excellent place to hang out if you don't want to be caught. So there was a group of insurgents, rebels, holed up in Masada. And, um, and I alluded to this story earlier. Uh, when they knew they were going to be captured, they did not want to be captured by the Romans. They would rather die. And so they chose 10 men. Every, everybody killed their own families. And then they chose 10 men to kill the rest. And then they chose one of those 10 to kill the other nine. And then the last one killed himself. Um, my son went to Israel last Christmas, uh, not this past Christmas, but the year before. And he went and visited Masada. And he, uh, these are some of his photographs. Um, here, it kind of shows you how high up you are. They have a trolley car that takes you up to go up um, to see. And then I have two other pictures. This is, you're up above and looking down, and you can see a winding road that takes you up. And then everybody look at this picture, because you're going to get it, and you're going to say, what the heck is she showing me? OK, it just looks like a pile of dirt. This is the remains of the Roman rampart they put up against the Masada to run the siege engines up. You know, they built an earth ramp. This is an earth ramp leading up to the top, made by the Romans 2,000 years ago, and it's still there, which is cool, right? It is cool. All right. So take a look at those. Oh, okay. Well, what was the earth ramp used for? No, I said the, for the Romans to, to attack. The Romans built it to. No, you didn't, you guys didn't. No, you haven't read about Spartacus yet. Um, oh, we don't have a good, we just don't have a good one. I'm sorry. You'll have to wait. Next week, we'll have an excellent poem. Oh, but while we pass the pictures, very quiet, awkward elephants play crazy chess. The Viminal, what? Oh, all right. I don't know why I want to do it then. OK, all right. The Viminal, the Aventine, the Quirinal, the Esquiline, the Palatine, the Celian, the Capitoline. Boom. Boom. All right. You, when the pictures we, weave their way through, you can just leave them back there. And I want, after you look at the pictures, I would like you to get out your copy of Julius Caesar. And Simeon, don't worry. If you have copy of Julius Caesar. It's all right. Some of you, I see yours look like mine. Um, it 
doesn't matter what copy you have. Yes, you can get it free online. Um, the only thing that makes some copies better than others is they have better notes at the bottom, you know, like explanatory notes. So, some of you have read a Shakespeare play before. Some of you have read this Shakespeare play before. Some of you have not. I want to point out a couple of things, and then I'm going to actually, part of the morning, I'm just going to read out loud to you. Um, I'm going to have you guys do some reading, but I'm going to do a lot of the reading, and here's why. It's not to insult your skills, but this is a different sort of language, and I know what they're saying, and you might not know what they're saying, and I, I will, you know, put my emphasis better. Anyway, I'm sorry, Ethan. Don't cry. Don't cry. He's wiping his eyes. Oh, she insulted me. No, but I'm going to have you guys t take some turns. So Shakespeare is writing. So are we all familiar with who William Shakespeare is? Yeah. We've heard, we know he's English and we know he wrote a bunch of plays and he's considered really awesomely great. He also wrote a lot of poems. And uh, he lived about 400 years ago, give or take, a little over 400 years ago. This play was first performed in 1599. Now. Think about that. Julius Caesar died before Jesus was born. And this play was written in 1599. So this is not a contemporary account of Julius Caesar. This is 1600 years later. William Shakespeare is not trying to write history. He's writing a play. Now, the things he writes about are true and really happened, but he gives them a spin to suit his own purposes. Do you know what I mean by that? Like, he will make characters be a certain way because it suits his plot. Mm -hmm. It suits what he wants to bring out. So just because it happens in the play Julius Caesar does not mean that it was actually that way in real life. However, most of it was. It was All right. Yes, yes. yes. Exaggeration. Yes, yes. For emphasis. Shakespeare plays are divided into five acts. So when you open up your uh, playbook, um, you will, well, the first thing, this is very, very handy. There is a page called Dramatis Personae. Dramatis Personae. People of the drama. In other words, it's the list of characters. This is very helpful because when you read the play and somebody starts talking and you're like, who is that? Go here and it will tell you. All right? If you forget who someone is, go here and it will tell you. Does that make sense? Three senders, not four. What? Um, so the play itself is divided into acts and the acts are divided into scenes. Okay? And in each scene, Shakespeare tells us where it's happening. So everybody, I, I turn to Act One, Scene One, wherever that is. It's on page one of the Dover edition. Yes, Act One, Scene One, Rome, a street. Okay, great, got it. I'm in Rome, I'm on a street. Not hard, right? And it says, Enter Flavius. Marullus and certain commoners. Now, who are Flavius and Marullus? I don't know. I better look at my dramatis personae. And it tells me that, if I can find it, they are tribunes. They are sort of rule makers, guardians of the people. And then we have commoners who shall remain nameless because they're not that important. So Just where were these um, So look down. Kyle, um, kind of, oh, I've lost the page again, about midway, under the conspirators against Julius Caesar, do you see it says Flavius and Marullus tribunes, okay? So sometimes you might have to look a little bit. It's, it's nice, you know in movies sometimes they have cast in order of appearance, you know, when they, when the, that'd be nice if they did that, but they don't. <laughs> people of the play, people of the drama. 
right? So I am going to re just start reading, and we're just going to keep reading until it's time for you to leave, okay? And just talk about what's happening. And then you guys are going to read Acts 1 through 3. Yes, yes. Acts 1 through 3. Yes, Hannah. You know what? We are going to... Um, no, you don't. I was going to have you start uh, a chart, but I, I don't want to do that yet because if, if there's certain things, if you don't know them, I think we already talked about them anyway, so like a spoiler. We will start a new assignment next week. Okay? So you are free from writing. No, he's so old. We're sad. Okay. <laughs> you guys. Obviously, my job is not done. Okay, here we go. So Flavius and Marullus. Now, in the Dover edition, in the one I've got here, they've abbreviated people. Flavius turns into Flav. <laughs> and Marullus turns into Mar. And commoners are calm. We have first calm and sec calm. All right. If you're not sure, look back at the list and it ought to be fine. But remember, it tells you at the beginning of the scene who's in the scene. It gives you their full names. Okay. Flavius, the tribune, comes in and he says, I better get my glasses over my eyes. Hence, home, you idle creatures, get you home. Is this a holiday? What? Know you not being mechanical? You ought not walk upon a laboring day without the sign of your profession? Speak, what trade art thou? Okay, now in the, in the Dover edition, there's a little one by mechanical. Because he just said they were mechanical. Like, are they robots? No. <laughs> Down below it says, of the class of mechanic or artisan. They are artisans, common workmen. And Flavius just said, hey, what are you doing out? Because you're supposed to have some marks on you like of what job you are, what trade you're in. And they're all dressed up in their nice clothes. The first commoner says, why, sir, a carpenter. Marola says, where is thy leather apron and thy rule? What dost thou with thy best apparel on? You, sir, what trade are you? And he says, truly, sir, in respect of a fine workman, I am but, as you would say, a cobbler. Now, suddenly we go into the world of Shakespearean puns and groaning jokes. Uh, it says in my note, cobbler, well, okay, what is a cobbler? Do you know what a cobbler's job is? He fixes shoes, then shoes. But apparently the word cobbler also meant a clumsy worker. So now he's making a joke. I am but a cobbler. Marilla says, but what trade art thou? Answer me directly. He's like, okay, you're clumsy, I get it, but what do you actually do? He says, a trade, sir, that I hope I may use with a safe conscience which is indeed, sir, a mender of bad souls. <laughs> oh, I know, I'm telling you. What trade, thou knave, thou naughty knave, what trade? And he's, nay, I beseech you, sir, be not out with me. If you be out, sir, I can mend you. In other words, if your shoes are worn out, I can. <laughs> oh, I know. What means thou by that? Mend me, thou saucy fellow. Why, sir, cobble you. Thou art a cobbler then, art thou? Truly, sir, all that I live by is with the awl, like a needle, okay? I meddle with no tradesmen's matters, nor women's matters, but with all. I am indeed, sir, a surgeon to old shoes. When they are in great danger, I recover them. As proper men as ever trod upon neat's leather have gone upon my handiwork. All right. It would be nice, maybe, if the guy just said, yeah, I fix shoes. He's a surgeon to old shoes. But this is not what Flavius wants to ultimately know. He says, but wherefore art not thou in thy shop today? Why dost thou lead these men about the streets? He says, truly, sir, to wear out their shoes, to get myself into more work. Oh, man. But indeed, sir, we make holiday to see Caesar and rejoice in his triumph. Marullus says, wherefore rejoice? What conquest brings he home? What tributaries follow him to Rome to grace in captive bonds his chariot wheels? 
You blocks, you stones, you worse than senseless things. Oh, you hard hearts, oh, you cruel men of Rome. Knew you not Pompey? Now, this week in Dorothy Mills, you're gonna read about the next general, Marius Sulla Pompey, all right? Remember, we have a series of generals that everybody loves until they don't love them anymore. And they move on to the next guy. These guys are out having a party for Caesar in the streets, like holiday, they close their shops. And the Tribune says, you're having a party for Caesar? Didn't you used to love Pompey? Wasn't he your guy? Okay, so let's keep up with him. Knew you not Pompey? Many a time and oft have you climbed up to walls and battlements, to towers and windows, yea, to chimney tops, your infants in your arms, and there have sat the live long day with patient expectation to see great Pompey pass the streets of Rome. And when you saw his chariot but appear, have you not made a universal shout? That Tiber beneath trembled underneath her banks to hear the replication of your sounds made in her concave shores? You shouted so loud it echoed. And do you now put on your best attire? And do you now call out a holiday? And do you now strew flowers in his way that comes in triumph over Pompey's blood? Caesar has just come back from conquering the sons of Pompey. Because Pompey at this point, you're gonna find out is. <laughs> Be gone. Run to your houses, fall upon your knees, pray to the gods to intermit the plague that needs must light on this ingratitude. How could you turn on one guy and follow another guy so fast? All right, Flavius calms him down. Go, go, good countrymen. And for this fault, assemble all the poor men of your sort, draw them to Tiber banks, and weep your tears into the channel till the lowest stream do kiss the most exalted shores of all. Which my note says, the high water mark. Let's think about what that means. Cry into the river until the lowest stream kisses the high water mark. What's he saying they're gonna do? He said, cry into the stream until the lowest stream kisses the high water mark. You pour so many tears into the river, it rises. Does that make sense? Okay, the commoners leave. It says, exuant, they exit, all the commoners. See whether their basest metal be not moved. They vanish tongue-tied in their guiltiness. Go you down that way towards the capital. This way will I. Disrobe the images if you do find them decked with ceremonies. And my note says, festival ornaments. Oh, they've been running around Rome decorating statues of Caesar. How do these tribunes seem to feel about Julius Caesar? They just chewed these guys out for not being faithful to Pompey. And they said, oh, go take those decorations down off the statues. We can't have any of this for Julius Caesar. I'll about and drive away the vulgar from the streets. So do you too, where you perceive them thick. These growing feathers plucked from Caesar's wing will make him fly an ordinary pitch, which means the highest stage of a falcon's flight. In other words, Caesar's on the uprise. Is it, in is it in parentheses? No. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, we did, okay. May we do so? I'm sorry. May we do so? Can we unrobe the statues? You know it is the Feast of Lupercal. Okay, it tells us the Lupercalia, a very ancient festival of purification annually celebrated at Rome in February. Okay. It is no matter. Let no images be hung with Caesar's trophies all about and drive the vulgar from the streets. So do you too, where you perceive them thick. These growing feathers plucked from Caesar's wing will make him fly an ordinary pitch. Who else would soar above the view of men and keep us all in servile fearfulness? Okay, 
we're going to pluck some feathers from Caesar's wing. We're going to pluck down the decorations in his honor. Because if we don't, he's just going to keep flying high. We need to pluck some feathers out of his wing. Make sense? All right. Now, scene two says a public place. This is not very specific. Apparently, it doesn't have to be. And it says flourish. <laughs> what? What did you say? <laughs> Probably not because there's going to be a race. There's going to be a foot race here shortly. Um, it says flourish, which usually means a trumpet blast because someone's entering. Like not somebody's entering the play, but somebody's entering in the play, in the plot. Somebody important is entering. Yes. <laughs> it's like a DUI test. Okay. Enter Caesar. We know who Julius Caesar is. He's the guy who's the play is about. Antony, if we look back in our cast list, we see he is one of the triumvirs after the death of Julius Caesar. Well, that doesn't mean anything to me right now, so I'm going to ignore that. Calpurnia is, I have to look at the bottom, wife to Caesar. Portia, she's at the end, wife to Brutus. Decius, Cicero, Brutus, Cassius, and Casca. Ooh, they're conspirators against Julius Caesar. And follow a great crowd, and among them a soothsayer. Caesar yells out to his wife, Calpurnia! And Casca, peace, ho, Caesar speaks. And all the music stops. Music Calpurnia! She says, here, my lord. <laughs> Stand you directly in Antonius's way, where he doth, when he doth run his course. Antonius, Caesar, my lord, forget not in your speed, Antonius, to touch Calpurnia. For the elders say the baron, touched in this holy chase, shake off their sterile curse. What? Okay. The Lupercalia is supposedly a festival to the wolf that Romulus and Remus, you know, yeah. raised Romulus. Yeah. Okay. So just don't ask me any whys. I'm just saying. I didn't make this up. The deal is a bunch of young guys kind of stripped down to basically like athletic shorts, you know, I mean, just like whatever. They take off their tunics and they run around the city and they, they have little like switches and they don't beat people, but they, they tap people. And if you tapped a woman, it made her able to have a baby. I told you, don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently Calpurnia is not getting pregnant. And Caesar is telling his friend Antony, hey, when you're running in the race, don't forget to give Calpurnia a whack <laughs> so she can get pregnant. I did not make this up. <laughs> yeah, with the, with the little, it's either his hand or with their little wands that they have in their hands, but not so bad that it like raises a welt. You know, just a, like. Okay, I shall remember, Antony says, when Caesar says, do this, it is performed. Set on and leave no ceremony out. And there's another flourish, the trumpets. Okay. Then a soothsayer. Caesar! Ha! Huh, who calls? Then every noise be still. Peace yet again. Who is it in the press that calls on me? I hear a tongue, shriller than all the music, cry, Caesar! Speak! Caesar is turned to hear. And the soothsayer says, beware the Ides of March. Okay, that's March 15th. Um, and Romans had Ides and Calends. The Ides is the 15th and the Calends is the 30th. Again, don't ask. Okay, so like there's the Ides of April. There's every month has an Ides. But this in particular one is the Ides of March. Caesar says, what man is that? Brutus next to him says, a soothsayer bids you beware the Ides of March. Set him before me. Let me see his face. Um, Casca says, come, fellow, come from the throng. Look upon Caesar. What sayest thou to me now? Speak once again. Beware the Ides of March. He's a dreamer. Let us leave him. Pass. All right. So they all just keep going to the festival, to the Lupercalia festival. But Cassius and Brutus stay behind. 
and they're going to have a little chat. Cassius asks, will you go see the order of the course? Are you going to go see the race? Not I. I pray you do. Brutus says, I am not gamesome. Our note says sportive. That's not much more helpful than gamesome. I don't feel like going to the races. I don't feel like sporting events and parties. I do lack some part of that quick spirit that is in Antony. Let me not hinder Cassius your desires. I'll leave you. Cassius says, Brutus, I do observe you now of late. I have not from your eyes that gentleness and show of love as I was, was wont to have. You bear too stubborn and too strange a hand over your friend that loves you. All right. Brutus, you don't seem quite yourself lately. I don't have that same gentleness and show of love I usually get from you. Usually we're, okay friends, you seem a little distant. Brutus says, Cassius, be not deceived. If I have veiled my look, I turn the trouble of my countenance merely upon myself. Vexed I am of late with passions of some difference. My note tells me conflicting passions. I've got a conflict in here. I'm arguing inside myself. Conceptions only proper to myself, which gives some soil perhaps to my good behaviors. I want to keep it to myself, but they soil my usually good behaviors. Yes. Be let, but let not therefore my good friends be grieved, among which number, Cassius, be you one, nor construe any further my neglect than that poor Brutus with himself at war forgets the show of love to other men. Cassius says, then Brutus, I have much mistook your passion by means whereof this breast of mine hath buried thoughts of great value, worthy cogitations. I've been thinking about something, Brutus. If you learn cogito, cogito means I think in Latin, cogitations means thoughts. Brutus, I've been thinking about something. Tell me, good Brutus, can you see your face? Brutus says, no, Cassius, for the eye sees not itself but by reflection, by some other things, right? Can you see your own face without a mirror? <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. Um, he, he says, no, you have to have it reflected in something else to see your face. Cassie says, it is just. And it is very much lamented, Brutus, that you have no such mirrors as will turn your hidden worthiness into your eye, that you might see your shadow, in other words, your image. Brutus, you need a mirror. You need some sort of mirror that will show you how worthy a person you really are. I have heard where many of the best respect in Rome, except immortal Caesar, speaking of Brutus and groaning underneath this age's yoke, have wished that noble Brutus had his eyes. Cassius is letting some bombs drop. First, he just called Caesar immortal Caesar. Is he being serious? Is he being mocking? We don't know yet. Then he says, people are groaning underneath this age's yoke. Do you know what a yoke is? The thing you strap on oxen or something to pull plow. So if he thinks the Roman people are groaning underneath an, a yoke, does he think they're well off? Yeah. No. Things are bad in Rome. And there's many that wished noble Brutus had eyes. To see what? Maybe Brutus is intrigued now. Brutus says, Into what dangers would you lead me, Cassius, that you would have me seek into myself for that which is not in me? He says, therefore, good Brutus, be prepared to hear. And since you know you cannot see yourself so well as by reflection, I, your glass, your mirror, will modestly discover to yourself that, uh, that of yourself which you know not of. And be not jealous on me. Be not suspicious of me, gentle Brutus. Were I a common laugher, 
Or did use to stale with ordinary oaths, my love, to make to every new protester? If you knew, I'm sorry, if you know that I do fawn on men and hug them hard and after that scandal them, or if you know that I profess myself in banqueting to all the rout, then hold me dangerous. Okay, do you know me as someone who just makes promises and breaks them? Do you know me as somebody who like parties, hangs out at the banquet and just spills my guts to everybody? No. No. Suddenly, in the distance, they hear a flourish, another trumpet, and a shout. And Brutus says, what means the shouting? I do fear the people choose Caesar for their king. Cassius says, I, do you fear it? Then must I think you would not have it so? Brutus says, I would not, Cassius. Yet I love him well. But wherefore do you hold me here so long? What is it that you would impart to me? If it be aught toward the general good, set honor in one eye and death in the other, and I will look on both indifferently. All right. I will do anything honorable, even if it leads to death. For let the gods so speed me as I love the name of honor more than I fear death. Cassius says, I know that virtue to be in you, Brutus, as well as I do know your outward favor. I know your inside honor just as well as I know your face. Well, honor is the subject of my story. I cannot tell what you and other men think of this life, but for my single self, I had as lief not be as not be as live to be in awe of such a thing as I myself. I'm going to read that again. I had as lief, I'd rather not be as live to be in awe of such a thing as I myself. I'd rather not exist than be in awe of another human being, another such as I am. I was born free as Caesar. So were you. We both have fed as well, and we can both endure the winter's cold as well as he. For once, upon a raw and gusty day, the troubled Tiber, chafing with her shores, Caesar said to me, Darest thou, Cassius, now leap in with me into this angry flood, and swim to yonder point? Upon the word, accoutred as I was, I plunged in and bade him follow. So indeed he did. The torrent roared, and we did buffet it with lusty sinews. We're swimming across throwing it aside and stemming it with hearts of controversy. But ere we could arrive at the point proposed, Caesar cried, help me, Cassius, or I sink. I, as Aeneas, our great ancestor, did from the flames of Troy upon his shoulder, the old Anchises bear, so from the waves of Tiber did I, the tired Caesar. And this man is now become a god, and Cassius is a wretched creature, and must bend his body if Caesar carelessly but not on him. He had a fever when he was in Spain, and when the fit was on him, I did mark how he did shake. It is true, this god did shake. His coward lips did from their color fly, and that same eye, whose bend doth all the world, did lose their luster. I did hear him groan. Aye, and that tongue of his that bade the Romans mark him and write his speeches in their books, alas, it cried out, give me some drink, Titinius, as a sick girl. Ye gods, it doth amaze me a man of such a feeble temper should get the start of the majestic world and bear the palm alone. All right. What does Cassius see in Julius Caesar? They once took a race across the river, and Julius Caesar's like, help me, I'm going to sink. What do you think, EJ? What does he see? Weakness. Just a guy. Just a guy. He was sick in Spain once. He's like, oh, oh, I need a drink. <laughs> He's just a guy. And now Rome is treating this just a guy like a god, and we're all supposed to bow down. I hope that shows you how Cassius is feeling. All right? So here's what I'd like you to do. No writing. I want you to read Acts 1, 2, and 3. Obviously, we've already read part of Act 1. Here's the thing. I'm not asking you to write. Read slowly. If you're like me, I read fast. I read too fast sometimes. I have a bajillion things I want to read and so, and then I don't follow. I want you to soak it up because a lot of the language, Shakespeare language problem is just people read it too fast and they want to understand it immediately like we would modern language. 
but often he just says things in a poetic way. All right. So give yourself a chance. You know, if you if you're not sure what he means, stop and think about the words. All right. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to take up there next week, and we're going to read as much of Acts 1 through 3 as we can together. Maybe taking some parts, but we're going to go through the whole thing together. And I, I know it's tiresome to just like sit and listen, but it's the best way to go through a play the first time. Okay? Yes, sir. So, um, I, if there's a, there's a YouTube video on the, uh, on the Jewish Union, but I like to listen to it and read it at the same time. Yes. That is, that's, compare the two stories. Sure. So it's different and what's not. That's a good idea. So if you have an audio version, if there's any audio version where you can listen to it, yes, um, that's great because then they're going to give the emphasis to the words in the right places, which I botched a little bit today, but you guys are gracious. Um, so read your, read your Dorothy Mills, work through the first three acts the best you can. If there's things you're not quite sure you understand, do not worry. All right? Just come to class and ask your questions. All right? And I will see you next week. Bye-bye.